Book 4 of Knowledge and Probability Synopsis of the Fourth Book Chapter 11 of I Knowledge of the Existence of Other Things 1. Knowledge of the existence of other finite beings is to be had only by actual sensation. The knowledge of our own being we have by intuition. The existence of a God, reason clearly makes known to us as has been shown, the knowledge of the existence of any other thing we can have only by sensation, for there being no necessary connection of real existence with any idea a man hath in his memory, nor of any other existence but that of God with the existence of any particular man, no particular man can know the existence of any other being, but only when, by actual operating upon him, it makes itself perceived by him. For, the having the idea of anything in our mind, no more proves the existence of that thing, than the picture of a man evidences his being in the world, or the visions of a dream make thereby a true history. 2. Instance, whiteness of this paper. It is therefore the actual receiving of ideas from without that gives us notice of the existence of other things, and makes us know, that something doth exist at that time without us, which causes that idea in us though perhaps we neither know nor consider how it does it, for it takes not from the certainty of our senses, and the ideas we receive by them, that we know not the manner wherein they are produced, v.g. whilst I write this, I have, by the paper affecting my eyes, that idea produced in my mind, which, whatever object causes, I call white, by which I know that that quality or accident, that is whose appearance before my eyes always causes that idea doth really exist, and hath a being without me. And of this, the greatest assurance I can possibly have, and to which my faculties can attain, is the testimony of my eyes, which are the proper and sole judges of this thing, whose testimony I have reason to rely on as so certain, that I can no more doubt, whilst I write this, that I see white and black, and that something really exists that causes that sensation in me, than that I write or move my hand, which is a certainty as great as human nature is capable of, concerning the existence of anything, but a man's self alone, and of God. 3. This notice by our senses, though not so certain as demonstration, yet may be called knowledge, and proves the existence of things without us. The notice we have by our senses of the existing of things without us, though it be not altogether so certain as our intuitive knowledge or the deductions of our reason employed about the clear abstract ideas of our own minds, yet it is an assurance that deserves the name of knowledge. If we persuade ourselves that our faculties act and inform us right concerning the existence of those objects that affect them, it cannot pass for an ill-grounded confidence, for I think nobody can, in earnest, be so skeptical as to be uncertain of the existence of those things which he sees and feels. At least, he that can doubt so far, whatever he may have with his own thoughts, will never have any controversy with me, since he can never be sure I say anything contrary to his own opinion. As to myself, I think God has given me assurance enough of the existence of things without me, since, by their different application, I can produce in myself both pleasure and pain, which is one great concernment of my present state. This is certain the confidence that our faculties do not herein deceive us, is the greatest assurance we are capable of concerning the existence of material beings. For we cannot act anything but by our faculties, nor talk of knowledge itself, but by the help of those faculties which are fitted to apprehend even what knowledge is are. But besides the assurance we have from our senses themselves, that they do not err in the information they give us of the existence of things without us, when they are affected by them, we are further confirmed in this assurance by other concurrent reasons a. 4. 1. Confirmed by concurrent reasons a. First, because we cannot have ideas of sensation but by the inlet of the senses. It is plain those perceptions are produced in us by exterior causes affecting our senses, because those that want the organs of any sense, never can have the ideas belonging to that sense produced in their minds. This is too evident to be doubted and therefore we cannot but be assured that they come in by the organs of that sense, and no other way. The organs themselves, it is plain, do not produce them, for then the eyes of a man in the dark would produce colors, and his nose smell roses in the winter, but we see nobody gets the relish of a pineapple, till he goes to the Indies, where it is, and tastes it. 5. 2. Secondly, because we find that an idea from actual sensation, 
and another from memory, are very distinct perceptions, because sometimes I find that I cannot avoid the having those ideas produced in my mind, for though, when my eyes are shut, or windows fast, I can at pleasure recall to my mind the ideas of light, or the sun, which former sensations had lodged in my memory, so I can at pleasure lay by that idea, and take into my view that of the smell of the rose, or taste of sugar, but, if I turn my eyes at noon towards the sun, I cannot avoid the ideas which the light or sun then produces in me, so that there is a manifest difference between the ideas laid up in my memory, over which, if they were there only, I should have constantly the same power to dispose of them, and lay them by at pleasure, and those which force themselves upon me, and I cannot avoid having, and therefore it must needs be some exterior cause, and the brisk acting of some objects without me, whose efficacy I cannot resist, that produces those ideas in my mind, whether I will or number, besides, there is nobody who doth not perceive the difference in himself between contemplating the sun, as he hath the idea of it in his memory, and actually looking upon it, of which too, his perception is so distinct, that few of his ideas are more distinguishable one from another, and therefore he hath certain knowledge that they are not both memory, or the actions of his mind, and fancies only within him, but that actual seeing hath a cause without. 6. 3. Thirdly, because pleasure or pain, which accompanies actual sensation, accompanies not the returning of those ideas without the external objects, add to this, that many of those ideas are produced in us with pain, which afterwards we remember without the least offence. Thus, the pain of heat or cold, when the idea of it is revived in our minds, gives us no disturbance, which, when felt, was very troublesome, and is again, when actually repeated, which is occasioned by the disorder the external object causes in our bodies when applied to them, and we remember the pains of hunger, thirst, or the headache, without any pain at all, which would either never disturb us, or else constantly do it, as often as we thought of it, were there nothing more but ideas floating in our minds, and appearances entertaining our fancies, without the real existence of things affecting us from abroad. The same may be said of pleasure, accompanying several actual sensations, and though mathematical demonstration depends not upon sense, yet the examining them by diagrams gives great credit to the evidence of our sight, and seems to give it a certainty approaching to that of demonstration itself. For, it would be very strange, that a man should allow it for an undeniable truth, the two angles of a figure, which he measures by lines and angles of a diagram, should be bigger one than the other, and yet doubt of the existence of those lines and angles, which by looking on he makes use of to measure that by. 7. 4. Fourthly, because our senses assist one another's testimony of the existence of outward things, and enable us to predict. Our senses in many cases bear witness to the truth of each other's report, concerning the existence of sensible things without us. He that sees a fire, may, if he doubt whether it be anything more than a bare fancy, feel it too, and be convinced, by putting his hand in it, which certainly could never be put into such exquisite pain by a bare ideal phantom, unless that the pain be a fancy too, which yet he cannot, when the burn is well, by raising the idea of it, bring upon himself again. Thus I see, whilst I write this, I can change the appearance of the paper, and by designing the letters, tell beforehand what new idea it shall exhibit the very next moment, by barely drawing my pen over it, which will neither appear, let me fancy as much as I will, if my hands stand still, or though I move my pen, if my eyes be shut, nor, when those characters are once made on the paper, can I choose afterwards but see them as they are, that is, have the ideas of such letters as I have made. Whence it is manifest, that they are not barely the sport and play of my own imagination, when I find that the characters that were made at the pleasure of my own thoughts, do not obey them, nor yet cease to be, whenever I shall fancy it, but continue to affect my senses constantly and regularly, according to the figures I made them. To which if we will add, that the sight of those shall from another man, draw such sounds as I beforehand design they shall stand for, there will be little reason left to doubt that those words I write do really exist without me, when they cause a long series of regular sounds to affect my ears, 
which could not be the effect of my imagination, nor could my memory retain them in that order. 8. This certainty is as great as our condition needs, but yet, if after all this any one will be so skeptical as to distrust his senses, and to affirm that all we see and hear, feel and taste, think and do, during our whole being, is but the series and deluding appearances of a long dream, whereof there is no reality, and therefore will question the existence of all things, or our knowledge of anything, I must desire him to consider, that, if all be a dream, then he doth but dream that he makes the question, and so it is not much matter that a waking man should answer him, but yet, if he pleases, he may dream that I make him this answer, that the certainty of things existing in rem natural when we have the testimony of our senses for it is not only as great as our frame can attain to, but as our condition needs. For, our faculties being suited not to the full extent of being, nor to a perfect, clear, comprehensive knowledge of things free from all doubt and scruple, but to the preservation of us, in whom they are, and accommodated to the use of life, they serve to our purpose well enough if they will but give us certain notice of those things, which are convenient or inconvenient to us. For he that sees a candle burning, and hath experimented the force of its flame by putting his finger in it, will little doubt that this is something existing without him, which does him harm, and puts him to great pain, which is assurance enough, when no man requires greater certainty to govern his actions by than what is as certain as his actions themselves. And if our dreamer pleases to try whether the glowing heat of a glass furnace be barely a wandering imagination in a drowsy man's fancy, by putting his hand into it, he may perhaps be wakened into a certainty greater than he could wish, that it is something more than bare imagination. So that this evidence is as great as we can desire, being as certain to us as our pleasure or pain that is happiness or misery, beyond which we have no concernment, either of knowing or being. Such an assurance of the existence of things without us is sufficient to direct us in the attaining the good and avoiding the evil which is caused by them, which is the important concernment we have of being made acquainted with them. 9. But reaches no further than actual sensation. In fine, then, when our senses do actually convey into our understandings any idea, we cannot but be satisfied that there doth something at that time really exist without us, which doth affect our senses, and by them give notice of itself to our apprehensive faculties, and actually produce that idea which we then perceive, and we cannot so far distrust their testimony, as to doubt that such collections of simple ideas as we have observed by our senses to be united together, do really exist together. But this knowledge extends as far as the present testimony of our senses, employed about particular objects that do then affect them, and no further. For if I saw such a collection of simple ideas as is wont to be called man, existing together one minute since, and am now alone, I cannot be certain that the same man exists now, since there is no necessary connection of his existence a minute since with his existence now by a thousand ways he may cease to be, since I had the testimony of my senses for his existence. And if I cannot be certain that the man I saw last today is now in being, I can less be certain that he is so who hath been longer removed from my senses, and I have not seen since yesterday, or since the last year, and much less can I be certain of the existence of men that I never saw. And, therefore, though it be highly probable that millions of men do now exist, yet, Whilst I am alone, writing this, I have not that certainty of it which we strictly call knowledge, though the great likelihood of it puts me past doubt, and it be reasonable for me to do several things upon the confidence that there are men, and men also of my acquaintance, with whom I have to do, now in the world, but this is but probability, not knowledge. 10. Folly to expect demonstration in everything whereby yet we may observe how foolish and vain a thing it is for a man of a narrow knowledge, who having reason given him to judge of the different evidence and probability of things, and to be swayed accordingly, how vain, I say, it is to expect demonstration and certainty in things not capable of it, and refuse assent to very rational propositions, and act contrary to very plain and clear truths, because they cannot be made out so evident, as to surmount every the least, I will not say reason, but, pretense of doubting. He that, in the ordinary affairs of life, would admit of nothing but direct plain demonstration, 
would be sure of nothing in this world, but of perishing quickly, the wholesomeness of his meat or drink would not give him reason to venture on it, and I would fain know what it is he could do upon such grounds as are capable of no doubt, no objection. 11. Past existence of other things is known by memory. As when our senses are actually employed about any object, we do know that it does exist, so by our memory we may be assured, that here two four things that affected our senses have existed, and thus we have knowledge of the past existence of several things, whereof our senses having informed us, our memories still retain the ideas, and of this we are past all doubt, so long as we remember well, but this knowledge also reaches no further than our senses have formerly assured us. Thus, seeing water at this instant, it is an unquestionable truth to me that water doth exist and remembering that I saw it yesterday, it will also be always true, and as long as my memory retains it always an undoubted proposition to me, that water did exist the 10th of July, 1688, as it will also be equally true that a certain number of very fine colours did exist, which at the same time I saw upon a bubble of that water, but, being now quite out of sight both of the water and bubbles too, it is no more certainly known to me that the water doth now exist, than that the bubbles or colours therein do so, it being no more necessary that water should exist today, because it existed yesterday, than that the colours or bubbles exist today, because they existed yesterday, though it be exceedingly much more probable, because water hath been observed to continue long in existence, but bubbles, and the colours on them, quickly cease to be. 12. The existence of other finite spirits not knowable, and rests on faith. What ideas we have of spirits, and how we come by them, I have already shown. But though we have those ideas in our minds, and know we have them there, the having the ideas of spirits does not make us know that any such things do exist without us, or that there are any finite spirits, or any other spiritual beings, but the eternal God. We have ground from revelation, and several other reasons to believe with assurance that there are such creatures, but our senses not being able to discover them, we want the means of knowing their particular existences, for we can no more know that there are finite spirits really existing, by the idea we have of such beings in our minds, than by the ideas any one has of fairies or centaurs, he can come to know that things answering those ideas do really exist, and therefore concerning the existence of finite spirits, as well as several other things, we must content ourselves with the evidence of faith, but universal, certain propositions concerning this matter are beyond our reach. For however true it may be, v.g., that all the intelligent spirits that God ever created do still exist, yet it can never make a part of our certain knowledge. These and the like propositions we may assent to, as highly probable, but are not, I fear, in this state capable of knowing. We are not, then, to put others upon demonstrating, nor ourselves upon search of universal certainty in all those matters, wherein we are not capable of any other knowledge, but what our senses give us in this or that particular. 13. Only particular propositions concerning concrete existences are knowable, by which it appears that there are two sorts of propositions. A. 1. There is one sort of propositions concerning the existence of anything answerable to such an idea as having the idea of an elephant, phoenix, motion, or an angel, in my mind, the first and natural inquiry is, whether such a thing does anywhere exist, and this knowledge is only of particulars, no existence of anything without us, but only of God, can certainly be known further than our senses inform us, too, there is another sort of propositions, wherein is expressed the agreement or disagreement of our abstract ideas, and their dependence on one another. Such propositions may be universal and certain. So, having the idea of God and myself, of fear and obedience, I cannot but be sure that God is to be feared and obeyed by me, and this proposition will be certain, concerning man in general, if I have made an abstract idea of such a species, whereof I am one particular, but yet this proposition, how certain soever, that men ought to fear and obey God proves not to me the existence of men in the world, but will be true of all such creatures, whenever they do exist, 
which certainty of such general propositions depends on the agreement or disagreement to be discovered in those abstract ideas. 14. And all general propositions that are known to be true concern abstract ideas. In the former case, our knowledge is the consequence of the existence of things, producing ideas in our minds by our senses, in the latter, knowledge is the consequence of the ideas, be they what they will, that are in our minds, producing the general certain propositions. Many of these are called etni veritates, and all them indeed are so, not from being written, all or any of them, in the minds of all men, or that they were any of them propositions in any one's mind, till he, having got the abstract ideas, joined or separated them by affirmation or negation. But wheresoever we can suppose such a creature as man is, endowed with such faculties, and thereby furnished with such ideas as we have, we must conclude, he must needs, when he applies his thoughts to the consideration of his ideas, know the truth of certain propositions that will arise from the agreement or disagreement which he will perceive in his own ideas. Such propositions are therefore called eternal truths, not because they are eternal propositions actually formed, and antecedent to the understanding that at any time makes them nor because they are imprinted on the mind from any patterns that are anywhere out of the mind, and existed before, but because, being once made about abstract ideas, so as to be true, they will, whenever they can be supposed to be made again at any time, past or come, by a mind having those ideas, always actually be true. For names being supposed to stand perpetually for the same ideas, and the same ideas having immutably the same habitudes one to another propositions concerning any abstract ideas that are once true must needs be eternal verities.